There are some people that go three days in the path of Allah. There are others that do 40 days in the path of Allah. There are some that do four months. And there are others that give their whole lives in the path of Allah. Now, I'm not sure if our next guest is of those people, but to me, he sure looks like it. Tills Kenj, how are you feeling, bro? Uh, no, what an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, to, man. Definitely, definitely not my whole life. But yeah. I'm just about to give one hour. So one hour. <laughs> Let's shoot. <laughs> May Allah accept for you. I was on the 17th level. Anything and everything that didn't remind me of Allah and His Prophet went down that shoot. Wow. <laughs> the mm. day that I started practicing, Wallahi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened the floodgates of risk. Multi millionaire. We're talking, <laughs> you know, big Maori guy comes walking past us and I said, hey, brother, what's going on? He said, no, nothing much. You know, we started talking. 45 minutes later, he made shahada. Allah Akbar. We just lost a very dear brother of ours, Koda Kenj. You know, I was with him two nights ago. He said, um, he w you wouldn't believe what happened, you know? You wouldn't believe what happened. Um, you know, this is... Uh, uh, this is, the, this is the, the best day of my life. You know? I don't know if you remember the moment I met you for the first time, but you just cracked me up so much <laughs> and it stuck out to me that you know, this, this brother, he's religious, but he has that, you know, that beautiful, the smile, the jokes, the laughter, and I just love that about you. And the truth is, you've been there this whole time, but I've never asked you this before. Where did it all begin? And I don't think anyone's asked you that before. I don't think I've ever heard you say this public, but, you know, yeah. where did it all begin? Um, basically, uh, it all started, and I hope, I hope my friend hears this. Uh, my friend dropped off some uh, DVDs or CDs yeah. of a particular speaker, very motivational speaker. Hob and Muhammad Hoblos? No, nah, no, nah, nah, hell no. Was it, hell <laughs> no. It, ca it couldn't be Muhammad Hoblos because I taught him everything he knows. Allah, you know what I mean? So, yeah, no, no, he we'll definitely... Send that, send that to Hoblos. <laughs> what did you do that for? The what? How rude was that? Relax, man. We're just having a laugh. What's wrong with you? He definitely wasn't before me. <laughs> nah, Allah... Um, now, very, very motivational speaker, and uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on his soul. And uh, it started from there. I started to listen to his talks. Uh, his talks drove me into the masjid. Wow, his, his talks drove me into the masjid. I, I walked into the masjid, and I found a bunch of brothers that looked at me as though I was a big fish, yeah. and they were, you know, a bunch of fishermen. You obviously didn't look how you looked. Nah, like, like nah. right now, like nah, nah, it must have nah. been an experience just walking. What yeah. was it like? Yeah, no, nah, it was good. See, look, the, I knew the brothers uh, yeah. as um, I used to play football with him. Uh, he used to live down the road. I see him walking around, you know, Auburn with his turban and whatever. Um, but they were never like close friends. Mm -mm -mm. And when they seen me, they knew, oh, you know, this guy's, you know, you know, ready to make a change. So they slowly, slowly ruled me in. Um, uh, the first move they done was they wanted to have a dinner at one of the brothers' houses, which was strictly for me and my wife, you know, Seriously. yeah, to get us interested. I was I didn't have a clue. I thought it was like a weekly dinner. There hasn't been a dinner since, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, I rock up uh, at the brothers' unit. Yeah. He stands at the door, uh, and he tells me, um, "Look." If, uh, if you can just tell your wife to go through it that way, yeah. in the second room on the right, I was confused. Yeah, what's going on with these guys? Huh? Yeah, <laughs> and, and you just come into the living room, you know? So I'm like, all right. I yeah. started to think maybe this is a setup or something. So little did I know, it was uh, them segregating, you know? Mm. Ladies on their own, men on their own. We walked out of there an hour or two later. Yeah. And my wife was like, oh, what beautiful girls and... I'm like, yeah, the, the guys are excellent. They're great. They're really nice, you know. And that's where it all started. Yeah. You know, like um, that mahabba. The mahabba. The love, the, the, love, the environment, yeah. the sisterhood, no, whatever. Nice. And then slowly, slowly, we just kind of like, uh, you know, uh, became like them, a religious you uh, know, person. What was the change like, I guess? Like coming from, I'm not, I'm not sure like where you started off. So like before you actually became, you know, started practicing, what was your life like? Uh well, uh, it was worked. I worked and my wife worked in Parramatta. So we had a unit in Parramatta. Yeah. Um, I had my own little business. She was working at Commonwealth Bank. Uh, leave in the morning, come back at night. Mm. 
yeah. uh, sit in front of the TV, yeah. uh, try to watch as much Sopranos episodes <laughs> as possible. Um, she makes dinner, we eat, uh, we go out, uh, PlayStation, uh, you know, unfortunately living, you know, the life as, uh, you know, not the most practicing Muslim. Uh-huh. No, but that, that that's really interesting to see where you came from to where you were there. And then what was the journey like? As soon as you, you know, got involved, you just dumped straight into the deep end, right? Yeah, well, uh, that's that, that's exactly what I've done. They mm. say don't, don't jump don't in the deep that, end. Don't do that, yeah. <laughs> uh, I did it and alhamdulillah, I, I'm here, you know, whatever, 15, 16 years later. Um, I had a, I had a, I, now, I was on the 17th level in Parramatta. So we had the little um, uh, garbage room. So you enter the garbage room and uh, you've got your chute. Yeah. So you put your rubbish in the chute, close yeah, the chute, yeah. and then it goes down into the basement. Yeah. I um, Anything and everything that didn't remind me of Allah and his prophet went down that chute. Wow. <laughs> Allah um, Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Literally throwing everything out. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. And then the next move was um, to move out of there because it, was, it wasn't the right environment. Um, yeah. And... Uh, I just wanted what was closest to the masjid because I was originally from Auburn and um, back then it was only Masjid Amr, the old Masjid Amr, yeah, yeah, 2004, yeah. you know? Yeah. So um, I said closest thing to, to Masjid Amr and I found the unit maybe around 200, 300 meters away. Wow. And that's it. I started walking Most the people will go through like a burnout though. Like you see it happen a lot. You see a lot. a lot of brothers that come to the masjid, pump, 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 yeah. and then they burn out after literally one week yep, and then yep, you never yep. see them again. Yes, but I've seen it for many years. Yeah. I've seen a thousand come on and 990 stay on. Uh, sorry, <laughs> 990 fall off yeah. and, and, and a handful stay on. Um, the example that I always give uh, is that it's like that guy that started to go to the gym, yeah? Mm. He starts to carry light weights yeah. because if he goes heavy, he'll hurt himself. Yeah. Um, but eventually, he has to keep on increasing, or yeah. he won't see a change. Yeah, hundred percent. Hundred percent. You you start you know bench pressing ten kilos because you're not used to it and your muscle can't take it. Mm -mm. But two three weeks later, you have to increase to fifteen or twenty, and so on and so forth. And if you're not carrying the maximum capacity that your body can take then your body's not going to grow as as you wish yeah and that's what my advice to everybody i'm not here to give advice of yeah, course yeah, but yeah. my advice to everybody is that you have to keep on increasing so mashallah from nowhere you're in the masjid that's great mm. what are you doing oh, i'm praying i shout in the masjid every night excellent what's your next step don't ever believe that you can uh, increase by just praying i shout in the masjid yeah. You know, you got to move to the next step. What's your next step? Okay, I'm going to start uh, something to do with knowledge, yeah. a Quran lesson, a fiqh lesson. You know, that's great. What about the da'wah side? Um, inshallah, I will start to sit in talks and yeah. learning so that I eventually can start to give a talk. Increase. You know, or, or a word here and there. You so know? you were speaking about getting involved in da'wah. Do you think getting involved in da'wah was like one of the main, I guess, avenues of keeping yourself steadfast? Yeah. Would yeah, you yeah. would you say that? Yeah, yeah. That da'wah is da'wah is the key to increasing iman. Da'wah yeah. basically what da'wah is uh what you know the 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 good word that comes off your tongue. Um, uh, whether it's to the guy at work, to your neighbor, to your brother at home, mm. uh, reminding him, reminding him about the prayer, reminding him about you know fearing Allah, to stay away from the haram. This is all uh, dawa, and anything that comes off that tongue affects the heart. Yeah. You know, it's only a hand span away, yeah. but you know, wallahi, it's uh, it's the most important journey yeah. ever. Now you've been actually involved in like dawa, the field of dawa, tabligh, this that for I, I, like ever since I can remember, and that's yeah. like I'm going back like nine years ago, like in terms of the the dawa scene, and I've seen you in in the field, mashallah, doing your thing. But would you say there has been any standout moments, standout experiences on this journey of giving dawa that really reminded you? This is why I'm in it, you know, this is why I'm doing it. SubhanAllah. Um, well, look, I never thought of that question, but right now, as you said it, a couple of things just came Allah to Akbar. my mind. SubhanAllah. Allah. Allah. <laughs> um, number one, uh, my four months. Yeah. My four months in 2012 um, had to be like a life changer. So those that don't know four months, that's like just going in the path. Straight four months. We've done our first 40 days in uh, uh, India. 
our second 40 days in uh, Egypt and our last 40 days in Pakistan. 40 plus 40 plus 40. Yeah, yeah. 120. That's, that's, four, <laughs> that's your four months. Yeah. You know, uh, that was a life changer. I was, I was literally uh, in the middle of that Khuruj uh, in Egypt and uh, I was speaking to the Sheikh, the Amir, and I was saying, Sheikh, what do you reckon about this idea that we make up business cards <laughs> with our name on it and the masjid and the address and on the back of the card, our weekly programs. So you were pumped, man. Yeah, yeah. I was flying. Yeah. I literally <laughs> give these cards out, you know, and yeah. there's my number if you ever need anything, you know. That, that's that's what level we got to, you know. Yeah. Uh, it didn't really eventuate, <laughs> but a lot of change, yeah. And another quick story um, was one time we were in New Zealand. Yeah. Uh, that was 2012. That was... Um, no, sorry, 2011. Mm. 2011, I had just come back from South Africa and we went for 30 odd days to New Zealand. Uh, we met one brother named Abdul Aziz. He's a revert, Maori revert. Um, he took us around Friday night. He met us at Juma. He took us around Friday night to a few friends of his. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, one of them made shahada. Allah These Allah. were non Muslim Maori brothers. Um, uh, and then he said, I need you to come and visit my father in law. I said, why? What's the, yeah. you know, why are you so keen? He said, uh, when I became Muslim, my best friend became Muslim. And my best friend's sister became Muslim. When she became Muslim, we got married. Yeah. Uh, after we got married, my mother in law became Muslim. He goes, but my father in law hasn't become Muslim. I said, inshallah, yeah. we'll yeah. go. Let's do this, you know. Um, then he remembered it was a Friday night. And Friday night was footy night. And Friday night, footy night means. You know, get on the booze yeah, yeah, night yeah, drinks. and, 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 and get drunk. Yeah. He goes, look, it's going to be impossible to visit him. He won't be in his right mind. He goes, maybe we'll go tomorrow. So anyways, the next day, he, he mashallah, beautiful brother, he used to set up a stand uh, in a marketplace in, in, um, uh, in Hastings. Hastings, Hastings. Yeah. It's around six, seven hour drive from Auckland. Yeah. Um, he would set it up at around... 6.30 to get the best place, mm. you know. Uh, it was a cold morning. It was around June, July. Um, literally, we had frost all over our windscreen. We um, we went out there. The lady beside us was selling beanies and gloves. I, I, I think we made her like $500. Like, we were like 10 of us, you know. <laughs> um, we, uh, we went out there, set up, and as the uh, morning went on, maybe 8, 9 o'clock, people started to roll into the market. And we started to, you know, give dawah, hand out some brochures, DVDs, little mushafs that he used to, mashallah, yeah. organize. Eventually at around 10, maybe 10 a.m., you know, a big Maori guy comes walking past us. And I said, hey, brother, what's going on? He said, no, nothing much. You know, we started talking. 45 minutes later, he made shahada. Allah um, uh, Allah when he made shahada, I said to him, what's your name? we got to, we got to give you a name. Yeah. Uh, and, he, and then he said, yeah, he said, same thing that my um, my family done as well. I said, what do you mean? He said, my family also became Muslim and they also changed their names. I said, who's your family? We're in the middle of nowhere. It's Hastings, you know. He said, oh, maybe you might know them. And he was giving me names, never heard of them. He goes, and my son-in-law, his name, they call him Abdul Aziz. Oh, my God. You know? <laughs> oh, my God. So we actually <laughs> bumped Allah. into his father-in-law the next morning. Coincidentally. Our, coincidentally. Allah and... And Abdul Aziz set up with us, but had to go to a doctor, a dentist appointment. And he wasn't there at the time. I called him. I said, Abdul Aziz, I got good news for you. He goes, yeah, brother. I said, your father-in-law just became Muslim. Allah, he said, no, no, don't joke. You know? I said, wallahi, your father-in-law just became Muslim. You give me goosebumps. <laughs> wallahi. Uh, Duhar, Asr, Maghrib, Aisha, that day, and the five salawat, the next day on Sunday, he came and prayed in the masjid with us. He was, he was there for Fajr. Wallahi, he came before Fajr. No, you know, you know, so some beautiful yeah. stories, many I, stories. But that, That's incredible. Like, for me, what it shows to me is like the dua of the one on, on that path. Yeah, yeah. It's just like mustajab. Allah is going to accept it. You know, 100%. you're on that path. You're, you're, you're coming with that sincere, noble intention, which we ask Allah to grant, you know, all of us. But it's just like, you know, you're in my path. Whatever you want, like, and and of course, guidance is in the hands of Allah. But that's that's incredible, bro. Um, Tills, I wanted to ask, when you decided, I know you that you've memorized the Quran. Alhamdulillah. And you know, f at what point did you say I want to go memorize the Quran? So you've like jumped into this dawah life. You've jumped into the deen, and you just like, at what point did you say, you know, I want to memorize the Quran? Or was it a sheikh that came and he said, hey, till. Yeah, no, 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 it was, a, it was a moment. It was, wallah, it was a moment. Um, 
2004 I started practicing and I had my little business. The mm. day that I started practicing, wallahi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened the floodgates of risk. Um, alhamdulillah, the business went you know, extremely successful. Uh, Multi-millionaire, we're talking <laughs> about, you know, one path is in a... <laughs> <laughs> now, wallah, look, um, uh, now, look, we got, believe it or not, over, just we hit the 9,000 mark in regards to customers. Allah regular Allah. customers who, who used to buy... Um, we manufactured toner cartridges of us mm -hmm. for the printer and the fax machine. Um, but it took my life, you know. Uh, I was practicing, I was, you know, on the path, I was trying, but the, my company was weighing me down, you know. Yeah. Uh, wallahi, there's no problem with having a company, a business, yeah. uh, a little side thing, but you should never allow it to take over your life, you know. Allah is priority, Deen is priority, and everything works around that. But unfortunately, sometimes, wallahi, I was doing from Fajr to 8, 9, 10, midnight, you know, when we used to get busy, you just, that's it, there was so much work on. Yeah. So finally, um, after a lot of, you know, trips, you know, khuruj and targhib, motivation, and hearing the, the virtue of memorizing the Quran, the virtue of uh, learning the deen, and the virtue of being in, you know, in the, in the path of Allah, I, um, I, I, I took the jump, man, Allah, I did it, and um, it was, Going back to du'a, it was uh, Ramadan 2007. I was making a lot of du'a, every sajda, throughout all the tarawih and tahajjud in the last 10 nights because I've done my atikaf. I was begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, open a way to release me from this, you know, from mm. this cage. It was like I was yeah. locked up in there. Um, uh, two days after Ramadan, I spoke to my partner who was, yeah. you know, uh, non-Muslim. Um, I said to him, look, man, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck and I'm caught up and I, want, I have so much ambitions I want to I want to do, I want to do. Um, what do you reckon that, you know, I take some time off and you take some time off, you know, like this? He said, look, it's going to be too hard. So he gave me like a list of options. One of them was that I sell my share. Wallahi, I sold my share 27th November 2007. And uh, I signed the contract in the solicitor's office on Auburn Road. I walked down, jumped in the car, and I went straight to the airport. And that's my that was my first trip. So, so you went like, I'm going. I'm going I'm to going memorize to, the, the Quran. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to memorize. I'm going to learn Arabic. I'm going to become an alim, you know? Yeah. That, that was like... My, the ambition. Yeah, that was my goal. Sold my car. A sister moved into my house. Um, and then, uh, alhamdulillah, first trip was to Yemen. I spent approximately six, seven months there. Uh, it was a beautiful experience, Mashallah. unbelievable in Tarim. Yeah. You're literally living in the desert. Yeah. Um, well, it's like another world, you know. It's like a little Islamic, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. society Mashallah. community. Everything's like everyone's wearing turbans and yeah. yeah. Wallahi, the yeah. ladies, like it's just mandatory that you cover up. Yeah. Not because there's a law. Mm. It's just normal. It's like mm. you know nature to just completely cover top to bottom. You know. Yeah. Um, it was beautiful. Masjid was down the road. Masajid were everywhere, Adhan and you know, the whole lot of it. Alhamdulillah, I got 10 ajzat there. Subhan. I got 10 ajzat and then um, subhanAllah, like, um, uh, you know, I, Alhamdulillah, every time I tried to go away, my wife would get pregnant, you know. Um, <laughs> that would have been whatever, I don't know which child that would have been. But um, uh, I uh, had to go back uh, 2010. I went to South Africa, Khuruj, 40 days. Um, 40 days then backed on to 40 days in France. So we've done 80 days altogether. And throughout the whole trip, we're hearing about, you know, the virtue of the Quran, Quran and Quran. whatever. And then we had one ziyara, one visit to Darul Ulum Zakaria in Johannesburg, oh. uh, Lanasia in Johannesburg. When I walked in there, they have approximately 700 students at any given time. Wow, well, we got to see this, man. We yeah, gotta see it. yeah, yeah. Well, like 53 different countries from, from 53 different countries. Um, I, I looked. And I walked upstairs and I asked the admin, can I have an application form? Uh, I went back to Sydney after the 80 days. I signed it. I sent it through. They gave me the okay. I uh, applied for a, um, a place or a house on the grounds mm. of the madrasa. Uh, uh, they found me a place after a couple of months and I picked my family up and I went in January 2011 wow. and, and completed. Alhamdulillah. Well, alhamdulillah. That's actually a beautiful story. And I guess I, I love the fact that you said, you know, I'm going to bring my family with me. So it wasn't just like, look, I'm going to go, hey, I'll leave you guys. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to take you all with me. And it's you went to Johannesburg and you finished the Quran there. How long did it take? Um, so, of course, I had 10 ajzat. Yeah. I got there um, 
uh, January 18 mm. and I left June 18. I was there mm. for five months and um, uh, same story. As we got there, I found out my wife was pregnant. So mm. we had literally five months. Um, she wasn't up for giving birth in, 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 in South Africa. Country, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, uh, I, I, I didn't think I'd do it. Mm. I, I was given one advice by one of the elders in the madrasa. He's been there since 1982, since I opened. He said to me, uh, how long are you here? I said, five months. He goes, how many ajza have you got? I said, ten. He said, do you want to finish before you leave? Mm. I said, I, I don't think it's going to be possible. Think it's possible. I sa- he said to me, i tell you one thing. He said, eat less sleep less talk less you finish wow and that's what three I did. things three yeah. things huh? <laughs> the three most enjoyable things <laughs> sleep less eat less talk less wow man yeah. subhanallah and you're making, you're making dua allah allah oh. accept from you allah accept and, and make that like a maqam on yawm al-qiyamah Amen. for you because you know allahumma ja'alna min ahli al-quran hum ahluka wa the ones Amen. that are the people of the quran you know the, the special chosen people of allah you know that's that's a station in and of itself that I ask Allah, you know, for myself and also for our viewers and, and their families to be of the people of the Quran. Now, Teals, I know obviously from personal experience and I, I, I see him around, y- your beautiful children, mashallah. Um, I see him going and, and coming and memorizing the Quran, always holding the Quran and, and really trying to memorize it as well. Now, as a father, you know, we've spoken about what it's like for yourself, but as a father, what's it like raising children to also you know, memorize the Quran. Alhamdulillah. Um, wallah, to be honest, um, f- throughout the years and uh, through all this, you know, made a motivational talk and hearing about the virtue of the Quran, I've it's become like a, it's become something that has to happen in our house. Yeah. You know, the kids have to memorize the Quran. Yeah. You know, um, if you're older, you know, you, you got a lot of excuses. Mm-mm. So much responsibility. My my memory is not so good. And but as a, as a child growing up, these guys are like sponges, man. The kids are like sponges. Well, mm. uh, Abu Bakr, my uh, my second youngest, finished at ten years old. And like we were like trying to, you know, relax, slow down. <laughs> relax. You know, uh, quicker he comes, quicker he goes. You know, take it easy. Mm. Mashallah, Allah, stages both my boys. They'll memorize a, a, a page or half a page in four minutes. Wow. Wallahi, he'll go away and come back and I'll make him promise, did you memorize this in class? He says, Wallahi, I didn't memorize it in class. How did you just get that in four minutes? They're like sponges, you know, mm. um, especially you know, in the latter part of the Quran when many of the ayat are similar to um, mm. verses that you've memorized before. So it just becomes like just putting a puzzle, puzzle wow. together. Um, uh, but yeah, that's how it is for me. My two boys, alhamdulillah, finished. Um, at young age and now I've got my three girls all memorizing oh, um, full time um, and then my youngest boy he's uh, he's still you know too young to be uh, memorizing but inshallah that's that's the plan the plan is that they all memorize yeah. you know so, um, it, it's not it's not obligatory mm. you don't have to you're not a failure if you don't memorize the Quran not, yeah. um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't say you have to memorize yeah. the Quran you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala connected a lot of virtue to it yeah. Um, but yeah alhamdulillah wallahi you know, all the praises to Allah. Wallahi, it's, it's all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that my kids are in, in this situation. Allah is one that he, he facilitates, makes it easy. But I just, you know, I'm, I'm asking personally for myself, you know, what should I do if I want like my future kids to memorize the Quran? Like what's the best advice you could give to me? Should, like, should I put a tartib? Should I put a routine? Like what, what's the best way to go about it? Because personally for me in the home, I just lose my time. My time just it just withers away. I don't know why it does that, but what do you do to make sure the Quran doesn't, you know? Um, look, um, the kids, the kids have to hear it from a young age. They have to hear about the virtue, mm. and a kid he's easily motivated. Not like us. You tell a kid at six, seven, eight years old that um, he'll wear a, a, a you know a garment, you know, made out of silk. And he'll be on in, in a lofty status, and his parents will be wearing a crown. Mm. That um, if uh, if the sun was to rise upon you in this dunya, how bright would it be? This crown is brighter than that that sun, you know. Oh, yeah. So imagine this the hadith of Muhammad Sallam. Imagine now the half is. <laughs> oh. what, what what situation would he be in when they hear this? You know, it, it's they're the children. It's they, like motivation. They want it, yeah, they want it, and uh, you know you can't force it on them. 
you got to try your best yeah. uh, to make them love it. At a young age, it's hard to make them love it. Mm. But, I mean, as the years go by, I can see the, you know, the gradual love that my boys have built for the Qur'an. Wow, that's actually so beautiful. And I, and I, and I love the fact that you said, you acknowledge that, said, look, it's not obligatory. But I heard one sheikh say this, he goes, it's not obligatory to memorize the Qur'an, but it's obligatory to love the Qur'an. And I don't know if you see this, like I see it personally and it really kills me. Some kids, I guess, from the way they've been taught, yes, they've memorized the Qur'an, but they don't have that love. And of course, I'm not blaming the kid. I wouldn't blame the kid. But perhaps it was the way they were taught wasn't the best way. And, you know, we see it like, unfortunately, we see some harshness involved. Ajib. And it just doesn't work. Like, w w in your experience, what do you say? Well, it's, it's a no-brainer. Mm. These hadith came down for motivation. Mm. And it's the promise of Allah and His Prophet. The more you hear this... The more you hear the motivation, the more you get motivated. Yeah. It's simple. It's A, B, C. Yeah. And it's not about uh, there's going to be a talk about the Quran in Ramadan on the, uh, you know, the, on Laytul Qadr. There's going to be a big talk and different speakers. No, 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 no. It has to be daily. Mm -hmm. We have to hear a daily reminder about the Quran. That's why if, if you just go off topic for a minute, in Khuruj, we have a certain tartib in ta'lim. So we read the hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then we have a second part of the ta'lim, which is called the Qur'an halaqa. And it consists of reading the virtue of Qur'an, two or three hadith, and then sitting in a circle and going Reciting over it. some, some uh, uh, particular verses and particular chapters. So if a person spends three days, two, one day, one day he goes in Khuruj for one day and sits in this gathering, he feels an effect. He goes for 40 days. Every single day, there's this tartib of hearing about the virtue of the Quran. He starts to get motivated. Four months, every single day for 120 days, you're hearing about the virtue of the Quran and one, two, three, four. What happens to you? Eva, Eva, you will go away saying, you know, this. I've got to do something about this. There has to be a connection with the Quran. Or, or he'll say, look, you know what? Let's be honest, too hard for me. But my children, that's it. Never. Mm. That's why when you go to India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, mm. there's a Quran madrasa, they call it maktab, yeah. on every corner. Millions of hafaz. Wow. Millions of hafaz all around. Go to South Africa and England and see the, the effect that Tabligh has had on, on, on these countries. So many makatib, little um, schools for Quran. Come to Australia, come to Sydney. You have Masjid Noor. You have Al Bayan, uh, you have Lekemba, you have Sheikh Abdul Moiz's uh, Madrasa. It, it, it's everywhere behind, you know, uh, the the motivational talk of Quran through, you know, going out in the path of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and it's it spread yeah. all over the world. Like for me, it's like there's no need to be like being this forceful. You know, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna hit you. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do that. Like you're teaching a kid how to read the Quran. This is not how you should teach a kid how to love the Quran. In fact, you might even hate the Quran. So you just got to be motivation, motivating. You know, give him a bit of love. Hundred percent. But yeah, like I feel like I don't know. I, I, I'm speaking like from from my thoughts. But yeah. as a father, you you would know more yeah, more than yeah. me. But Subhanallah, um, Tills, I wanna. I want to show something to you and you know we're on the topic of Quran and I know you know you yourself your kids but there was also someone very special to you and and I want to show you one thing and I want to get your thoughts on it we just lost a very dear brother of ours Koda Kanj you know I was with him two nights ago we had performed Umrah in Mecca and then he left for Medina, spent the day in Medina, prayed the Dhuhr prayer in the Rawda, directly behind the Imam, spent two hours in the Rawda, in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then towards the end of the day, he was feeling some pain, some chest pains. And then when things got really bad, he laid down, surrounded by his family, just at the time of the Maghrib prayer, while the Adhan was being called, he laid there making shahada and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered for his life to be taken in Medina while the Maghrib Adhan was being called while making shahada 
just after performing Umrah, just after spending two hours in the Rawda, to be buried in the Baqiya with the guaranteed intercession of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What an amazing death. A death that by Allah, I'm green with envy. And the truth is my brothers and sisters that his death is not by luck. Because I bear witness and I testified that this brother, he worked so hard for it. He worked so hard and that he was so sincere that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala accepted him and gave him the honorable death that he has given. Who was that? Yeah, that's my brother. Can you explain what happened on that day? You were there. That's so beautiful, brother. Yeah, Alhamdulillah, we were there. Me, me and my other brother were there. Alhamdulillah. Who would have ever thought, SubhanAllah. It's true, you know, um, we, we, we did actually pray in that old day at the time. And um, he, was, he was perfectly fine. Um, and uh, yeah, we, was, we were lining up for a good hour just to get in, you know how it is. And then we finally got in and um, uh, <laughs> had to uh, jump over a few people uh, to get to the front row and um, finally got there. It's strange because um, I'd been to uh, uh, Medina many, many times before and uh, the front row the front row um, of Medina is not in the Rauda. Mm. <laughs> um, the front row of uh, Medina is around six or seven rows uh, in front of the Rauda. But for some strange reason that, that year it had been officially changed and front row was in Rauda and we found ourselves in the front row of the masjid and the front row of the Rauda behind the Imam for Dhuhr Salah. And we prayed, mashallah, Dhuhr Salah in, uh, in the Rauda. Um, yeah, so the last thing we were expecting is a few hours later, uh, my brother passes away, you know, um, perfectly healthy, perfectly fine. Uh, we went afterwards, <laughs> he wanted to um, buy dates. That was our last night. We were leaving 6 a.m. next day. Um, last night in Medina. Yeah, last night, in yeah, we had spent our time in Makkah already. Um, uh, I know usually everybody does Medina then Makkah, um, but we couldn't we couldn't do that. Subhanallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made sure that, you know, uh, he was in Medina that day, you know, the day that, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was going to take his soul. Um, uh, and then, um, yeah, he went and bought some dates uh, to, uh, as gifts, gifts for um, those people back home. Uh, and then uh, after after that, we all went our own way. Uh, he went up to he went up to his room. Uh, his wife and kids were there, um, and he says uh, <laughs> his um, his uh, his his family told me this afterwards. Of course, they said, "Oh, he said." Um, he, you wouldn't believe what happened, you know. You wouldn't believe what happened. Um, you know, this is uh, uh, this is the, this is the, the best day of my life, you know. And uh, uh, and he and he explained the whole story about how we got in and we made the front row and and um, and prayed the there. Um, and then uh, after Asr, he went to buy a hearing aid for a cousin in Lebanon because we we're going back to Lebanon after that um, uh, from a particular chemist. After that, um, they had lunch, and um, and then uh, uh, caught a taxi back to the Haram or back to the hotel. And as he got to the hotel, he just felt some chest pain. Um, we were. Um, uh, we were all supposed to meet half an hour before Maghrib in the lobby uh, to pray Maghrib together and to follow a janazah. That was the plan because we hadn't we were only in Medina for three days and we hadn't um, we hadn't followed the janazah. We hadn't followed the, um, a burial to the baqiyah, to the graveyard. And obviously, that's one of the you know one of the great things to do while you're there. So um, we were supposed to do afdhar 
when we prayed in the Baqiyah, <laughs> but um, subhanAllah, there was no, there was no um, burial after Dhuhr. So we said we'll go after Maghrib, inshallah. And uh, subhanAllah, he passed away just, just on the Adhan of Maghrib, subhanAllah. What a way to end. Mm, ajib, what a way to Not sad about the death, um, uh, how it happened and where it happened. And it's ajib, you know, uh, after nine months, uh, after nine months of uh, uh, living and breathing the Quran, he was in the same madrasa in South Africa. You know, he went, uh, his visa, they wouldn't extend his visa. So he said, you know what? He gave me a call. He said, uh, I'm, I'm going to come Umrah with you, with, if, with me and my Spur other Spur of the moment. Decision. Spur of the moment. Yeah, it was Ajib. Like, so strange how he didn't get his visa. It was, everything was so strange, but it all made sense afterwards. Alhamdulillah. You know, I, I remember your brother. Like, I, I wasn't on a first name basis, but I just remember your brother. And I remember he was just a serious guy. Like, he was, I used to go to the masjid and I just see him at, uh, you know, at that pillar and he's just very serious. He needs to get his Quran done. Mm. And it's, and it's going to get done. And he's just like, you know, it's, it's happening. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here. I'm not going to muck around with the boys, play around. You know, we were running a muck outside, but he was just mm. like, I'm sitting down. I'm going to get this done. And I was like, this guy, if he's not sincere, <laughs> I don't know who is sincere. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah. yeah, sincere, man. Sincere. To pick himself up at the age of 40 uh, with his kids, wife and kids, and go over. They were living in a two-bedroom unit. Um, you know, when I went over, I had, you know, three kids. He had five kids and they were growing up. You know, mashallah, his oldest was maybe 16, 17 at the time. And it was hard. The girls were in the one bedroom, uh, you know, uh, he's, uh, him and his wife in one bedroom. The boys were sleeping in the living room on, on the floor on a mattress. You know? Just like the yeah. struggle, the struggle. And it was just like, I feel like if, if you run to, you know, what's that hadith? You come to Allah walking, he'll come running. And it was just like, he went, he went, he went. And then to have that husn al-khatima, that, the good ending. You know, we I've been making dua for the past, you know, ten we they make the dua in the masjid in in in, in Witter. Allahumma saluka shahada fi sabilik wa, wa mawtan fi balidi habibik. We ask for a death in the, the city of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's just like a dream. Ajib. And and guaranteed intercession of the, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's just like, you know, if I die anywhere, let it be in Medina, but it's just Ajib. like Allah yakhtar, Allah chooses, Allah chooses. And it was just like I felt like your brother he worked for it. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely, definitely. Wallahi, his death was always written. He will die that day, um, but how are you gonna die? That's the question, you know. Uh, and he died. Well, mashallah, it was it was a beautiful death. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa taala planned everything. Wallahi, wa makaru wa makar Allah. We plan, and Allah subhanahu wa taala plans. Wallahu khairul makarin. Allah is the best of planners, and um, we had totally different plans. He was supposed to get his visa before he left the country. Uh, that way he would have had unlimited time, which is what I did. Mm. I didn't need it. I was only there for five months, but he, you know, he did need it because he was planning to stay much longer. But he didn't get it. He thought he'd get it over there. Didn't happen. Um, we didn't want to. We didn't want to spend our. Um, uh, we went to Lebanon for three days mm. beforehand. Then we went to Umrah, mm. and then we were supposed to come back and spend the rest of the time in Lebanon. But we, did, we didn't want to do that because from Beirut Airport to our area is a far drive. Mm. We just wanted to, we just wanted to, you know, go spend our time in Lebanon and then do our Umrah and go home. Mm -hmm. But Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said no. Mm -hmm. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said you, you will be, you will spend your last nights in Mecca and Medina. And I heard that he hadn't been in Mecca or Medina for like years. Eighteen, eighteen, 18 years. years. He had only spent Hajj uh, uh, one time, eighteen years beforehand. Um, he had he hadn't been to Lebanon for twenty years approximately from when he first uh, got married. He hadn't seen his brother for twelve years, and he met him in Lebanon. I went to Umrah with him. That's why know? he said it was my best day, right? Yeah, like with your brothers to pray in the Rolda in the front row. Um, yeah, he said it was it was it was the best day of his life, mm. and and yeah, mashallah. He, he's, wow. Best day of his life was the last day of his life. And inshallah, the best day of his life is the life is the day that he, he meets Allah. Allah that, that's absolutely incredible. Allah, it's, it's like for me, it was an ayah. For me, it was just like a sign from Allah. You know, you want to know Allah is working. <laughs> just that's look it. at this. This is Allah's work. You know, for that's 18 right. years, you've never been to Medina in 18 years, and and the day you decide to go, 
on the night you decide to leave, Allah says, no, 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 no. I'm going to take you here. And it's just like, what an honor. What a way to end. And wow, that, that, for me, it's just, you know, it, it hit me, as I said. And, I, and I, don't, I didn't know your brother that close, but it just hit me, that his story. And it was just like an inspiration. And, you know, just before we finish off, you know, this was your brother's, I guess we can say, legacy. When you pass away, what would you love to leave behind? Uh, <laughs> um, Allah, to be honest, I, I, I believe um, uh, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to use you to change other people is has to be um, the the ultimate thing to leave behind. You know, some people left behind masajid, um, some people left behind uh, you know some charity work, orphans that they uh, that they um, took care of for many years that grew up and, and became you know. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, responsible people, uh, but to leave behind people that are walking, talking dies on the earth is is the best sadaqah jariya I think uh, a person can have. You mm-hmm. know, someone that's going to to work to change other people mm-hmm. that are going to change other people. Mm-hmm. They're going to change. So you're you're dead. You've passed. You've left this dunya. Generations. And 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 people are working and working as you're in your grave. You know. Oh, I believe that's the key. That's absolutely beautiful. Tills, wallah. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you. Uh, I'm honestly honored to have you here. Ciao. And um, I really hope our viewers find you know benefit in this. For me, it was something personally beneficial for me. Personally, emotionally connected with with this story and with the stories um, our brother Tills told us. Leave comments, send us feedback, suggestions, whatever it may be. Jazakallah khairan for watching and until next time. If you enjoyed this video and everything else that One Path does and would like to see us produce more content, then please support us. Go to www.onepathnetwork.com. You can support us from as little as $1 a day. Much love and appreciation and may Allah bless you all.